السنة مثل سفينة نوح من ركبها نجا ومن تركها غرق السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد as to what proceeds after praising Allah the Most High separated from his creation in a manner which befits his majesty with love and veneration exclusively for him and asking him to send his salah and salam upon his final messenger and prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Qurashi we meet once again to complete that which we started to briefly go through the biography of Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab wa rahimahullahu ta'ala and after completing the biography of the Sheikh rahimahullahu ta'ala the next issue that will be discussed is Usas al-Da'wah the foundations or the fundamentals of the Da'wah of Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad Abdul Wahhab Rahimullah Ta'ala and then after that we will discuss the Wasai or the resources or the tools or the means that Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad Abdul Wahhab Rahimullah Ta'ala utilized or that were at his disposal so that he could uh, convey the message of Islam as it was conveyed by the messenger of Allah Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so we discussed yesterday that the Shaykh Rahimullah he started his da'wah in Basra known as Basra and when he escaped from Basra due to the people of Basra rejecting his da'wah and where he almost died and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a person by the name of Abba Hamidan to help him and assist him he returned back to Huraymila and he found that the people of Huraymila were upon something which was very similar to the people of Basra, meaning upon Bida, upon Shirk and Bida and Kuf. So after this first escape, did the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala remain quiet and said, you know what, I'm just going to stick to myself and I'm not going to get into any disputes, any confrontation, but I'm just going to stay low-key and just do what I got to do. I'm not going to discuss anything which is going to sabotage or be a threat to me. Now, this is not what the Sheikh did. The Sheikh, he did exactly the same what he did in Basra. Started disputing with them with regards to their beliefs. So the next question that we have is is that these were places that the Shaykh traveled to Basra and Hurayma. When did the Shaykh publicly in a full swing start according to the Dawah of Tawheed and speaking against 
a shirk and, and trying to eliminate it. So this is the question. So until then, he just went before that. The Sheikh's da'wah was focused to where he was geographically located. So if he was in Basra, he called the people of Basra. If he was in Hurimila, he started to discuss and dispute with the people of Hurimila. But after that, after Hurimila, he decided now that he was going to call to this da'wah of the Kitab and the Sunnah publicly and wherever his voice and his pen can reach, he wanted to go out publicly and call people to this da'wah, the da'wah of Tawheed and Sunnah, and the da'wah against Shirk and Bila. So he started this da'wah when he was 38 years old. How old was he? 38 years old after his father died. After his father's death, when the Sheikh reached the age of 38, that's when he started publicly calling everybody to Tawheed and the Sunnah and warning against Shirk and Bila. So he did get opposition in Hurayimila. So from Basra he went to Hurayimila. And his da'wah became public. Meaning that from Hurayimila he started calling everybody to this da'wah. Before that, it was only where he went. So the next question is, is that how many years did he stay in Hurayimila? The question is that he stayed in Hurayimila giving da'wah for 15 years. How many years did he stay in Hurayimila? 15 years. So when he reached Hurayimila, he got into the same dispute and confrontation that he got in with the people of Basra. And then in Hurayimila, after his father died, when he was at the age of 38, he decided to make his da'wah public to everybody, not only just to the people of Hurem. And he stayed in Hurem-Mila for 15 years. The next question is that, which book of his was from amongst his most earliest books? Or even you could say, one of the first books that he wrote. That is a question. One of the first books that he wrote was Kitab al So, one of the first books that he wrote is Kitab al-Tawheed. And many of you have seen the book Kitab al-Tawheed. Who's read Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah ta'ala's book Kitab al-Tawheed. Oh, has come across it and has seen it. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that one day we will be able to study this book. I have tried to collect as many explanations of this book and everything related to this book for many years now, alhamdulillah. I have a complete shelf in my library just dedicated to Kitab Tawheed. From its aspect of Aqeedah, its explanation, as well as Takhreej of all the narrations that have been mentioned. So then what happened? He was at Huraymila for 15 years. Did he leave Huraymila and decided to decide to go somewhere else? Yes, he did. From Huraymila, uh, he traveled to Uyayna. After he was made aware of a conspiring attempt that was made by the people of Huraymila to kill him. When he obtained knowledge and information, he decided to leave al and he moved to Uyayna. So he went to al Uyayna. So when he moved to al Uyayna, he destroyed all the purpose built or graves and trees that were worshipped other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he established the hudud, the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by legislating the punishment of zina a woman had fornicated and she had confessed 
to her fornication. When she was put on trial and she confessed and she said that she wanted to be purified and she wanted the punishment of her sin in this world, not in the hereafter, Imam Muhammad ibn Duhab ta'ala implemented the punishment of a married woman or a married man who commits fornication, then the punishment is that they should be stoned to death. Then what happened? Whilst he was in al -Uyayn. what happened after that? Somebody is asking, is how did he gain such authority? In the olden days, uh, the religious people would be turned to in order to settle a dispute or a punishment. So when some of the people of Uyayna came to him and, and, and told him about this woman and she came to him and she asked, and he was consulted and asked her what should be done with regards to this crime or this sin that she has committed. And he passed the judgment and they implemented it. In the olden days, it, was, it wasn't like today as we find like governments. So he started influencing the people of Uyayna, some of them, and they started supporting his fall. What happened after that is that after the incident of the woman who had fornicated and uh, the hudud had been established upon her, she came and confessed the crime to the people. As you know, you, you need to read about Arab Bedouin civilization. That Najd, where Muhammad Abdul Wahab lived, was controlled by tribal rule. And each village had its own shura and head of when all the disputes and all the crimes that were committed, they, they would sit down and they would disagree. It's, it still happens in a lot of places in the subcontinent. Also, till today in Saudi Arabia, the tribes that are, are present, a lot of the affairs go back to the tribes. So for example, if you're from a particular tribe and you kill somebody whilst you're driving by mistake, and you have to play the you have to pay the blood money for this, and you do not have the money, your tribe will gather all the money together and they will pay on your behalf. This is how tribe, tribes work. They work like a single family. Again, if you do something wrong, the tribe will take action against you. And regardless of what decision they make, nobody can oppose it. Now the tribes here in Saudi Arabia have all given bear to Ali Saud on the rule. So the rule has now has full authority to implement that. The tribal leaders have given their allegiance to the ruler and have recognized him as the ruler. So some of these uncivilized and hooligans, they, when they saw that Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab ta'ala now started implementing the Sharia when he was asked, when they saw now that this man, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimullah, was being referred to and was being consulted, and the judgments that he was giving were purely based upon the book of Allah and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. These people feared for themselves due to the oppression that they, that they were carrying out upon the people. So they complained to the leader of al -Uyayn. I said, you know, about, they complained to a leader by the name of Ibn Urayr, Urayr, who commanded the leader or the chief or the head of Uyayna, who was Uthman Ibn Ma'mar, to expel Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab from al -Uyayn. So This is what happened. So these people, when they saw that now, khalas, the zulm, the oppression, and the sinning, and this, this is going to finish them because 
Muhammad Abdul Wahab is going to want to implement the kitab on this book. They went to somebody who was above their tribal leader, above Uthman ibn Ma'mar, and they went to who? Ibn Urayyim. And Muhammad Abdul Wahab was expelled from Uyayna. They told that he should be expelled from there. Uthman ibn Ma'mar. Uthman ibn Ma'mar. So in 1158 after Hijri, Muhammad Abdul Wahab rahimahullah left Uyayna. So where did he go from Uyayna? So we know he started, he went to Basra. From Basra, he went to Huraymila. From Huraymila, he went to Uyayna. And then now from Uyayna, he went to Dar'iyya. So he left now Al Uyayna. And he went to Dar'iyya and he 1158 after Hijrah. So he went to Dar'iyya and there he went there as a guest to a man by the name of Ahmad ibn Suwailim al arim al arim And the head of al Dar'iyya was Muhammad ibn Saud. The head of Dar'iyya or the Amir of Dar'iyya was Muhammad ibn Ibn So he went to Dar'iyya. Now the question is that when he came to Dar'iyya, did the leader of Dar'iyya, Muhammad ibn Saud, did he know who Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab was and where he was coming from and what were the issues with him? The answer is yes. He did know. The two brothers of Muhammad ibn Saud, Mashari and Thanayyan, they explained the reality of the da'wah of Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Saud. To Muhammad ibn Saud. So Muhammad ibn Saud, he heard them out. He said, Seems that where this man goes, there's a lot of trouble. Moving from one place to the other, people disputing with him. So Muhammad ibn Saud was in double mind. He was double. He was in two minds. He was double minded of whether he should meet this man, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Was pessimistic, not sure. And he's the head of a Dar'i of a Dar'i. Then what happens? So it seems as though that Muhammad ibn Saud doesn't want to meet him, although his brothers have filled him in with regards to the da'wah of Muhammad ibn Saud. But no leader wants any turbulence, any trouble in his vicinity or his area, which is just going to bring unnecessary stress. How, which of us would like something like, why would we like to be tensed out and everybody say, you know, I don't want to get involved in this. You see, most of the people they do this. Yes or not? He's been told that he's been expelled from Ayayna. So what happens is he's sitting there. And this is the important role of Allah. People don't know this, but this is the reality. After my thorough research, I have found that this was the reality. The wife of Muhammad ibn Saud sees her husband perplexed and worried and confused and double-minded. So she says, she asks him and says, you know, what's disturbing? He said, it's this man, Muhammad 
bin Abdul Wahab. He's just been kicked out of Al Ayyna. He's had people. He's had problems in Huraymila. It seems the way where this man goes, there's a lot of a lot of baggage and a lot of turbulence and a lot of dispute and there's a lot of problems everywhere. Now he's come to us. He's come to us. He's come to Dar'iyah. So she said to him, she said that that which I have heard about this man is nothing but good. He calls to the Tawheed of Allah and he tells people to stop relying upon other than Allah and asking Allah. And he calls to the people to implement the sunnah. And he says that he, he tells the people to establish the hudud, the punishments and the laws of Allah. He doesn't call to anything that seems controversial. Why don't you meet him once in person rather than listening to anybody and then make your final decision? You should meet this man. Don't listen to anybody. Else. Make your own decision by meeting him in person. Rather than looking at those who may speak positive or negative of him, meet him in person yourself. And then make your decision. Then your decision will be based upon basira, upon, upon firm and clear knowledge. So, Muhammad ibn Saud, he said to his wife, Tayyip, I'm going to meet you. I'm going to meet Muhammad ibn Saud. So, he met with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and they had a very detailed discussion. So, look at this. The, the leader of the village, the chief of his, the tribe, goes to see the scholar. Doesn't call the scholar to him, but goes to see the scholar. Look at the respect that the people had even at that time for the people of knowledge. And when he heard what Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad al-Habrahim had to say, when he spoke, and he became really highly influenced, he said, Muhammad al-Habrahim, he said, I promise you security and protection. But on the condition that whatever the consequences of your da'wah and your call is, that if Allah grants you success, that you don't leave a dar'iyah, you don't go back to your You stay here with us. This is my condition. Help, protection, security, and support. The Sheikh said, I concur and I agree. And if I consent to your condition. So, Al Amir Muhammad ibn Saud accepted the da'wah of Sheikh Islam Abdul Wahab. Rahim Allah Ta'ala. Then the Sheikh was now had the support of a tribal leader, a chief of the tribe, the Amir of the tribe, the head of the tribe. And the Sheikh now started to give and call to his da'wah publicly. And once he started giving his da'wah, he, he requested something from Muhammad ibn Saud. He said, with regards to the people of Uyayna, that don't take khiraj from them. Khiraj is a form of tax that needs to be taken from the land which is cultivated. He said, if you don't take from them, maybe you know, forgive them from this tax. And maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring al ayayna under your control. And then that became true that he said, maybe Allah will open the lands for you and they will become part of your ruler. That's exactly what happened in the near future. Everything became under Dar'iyya. Now he was in Dar'iyya. He was not in Ayayna. He was in Dar'iyya. In Muhammad ibn Saud. 
So now it, it was as though he had the support of a state. You know, when you have the support of a tribe and its people and its leader, it is as though it is as good as being supported by a, a whole country. So this is what happened, and this is how they both united. Shaykh al Islam he said to Muhammad ibn Saud that your family will take control of ruling. My family the students will be responsible of implementing the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will carry them out, we will pass the verdicts. And this is how it is till this day. You will see, I saw that on the left you will see the Umarah sit and on the right you will see the ulama sit. So with regards to the next question is with regards to some of the students of Muhammad ibn Abdul Haq From amongst his students are his sons. Hussein. Abdullah Ali Abdul Aziz and his grandson Abdul Rahman ibn Hassan, Sheikh Hamd ibn Nasir ibn Ma'mar, Sheikh Saeed ibn Hijji, Sheikh Abdul Aziz al Hussein al Nasiri. These were some of the students of Sheikh al Islam Muhammad al Wahab, Rahimahullah ta'ala, from some of his most famous books. And we will talk about his books again. We'll just mention a few now. Kitab al-Tawheed, Kashf al-Shubhad, Sul al-Iman, Fadl al-Islam, Thalatha al-Usul, Wal-Usul al-Thalatha, Masail al-Jahiliyya, Adab al-Mashi al-Salah, Mukhtasar Zad al-Ma'ad, Mukhtasar Kitab al-Iman, Mukhtasar Seedat al-Rasul. Some of his famous books that are out there, and most of these have been translated into the English language. The last question is, is that when did the Shaykh Rahimahullah pass away? After his whole life was spent in learning, implementing, teaching and fighting in the path of Allah and calling towards the path of Allah. The Shaykh, he passed away in ad in the year 1206 after him. So this was with regards to his biography, very brief. And to strengthen the ties between the two families, Ahmed ibn Saud's family and Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Wahab's family, he married into the family. So now it became that the daughters of Muhammad ibn Saud, the daughters of Muhammad ibn Wahhab and their families, they were all interrelated. They became like one big family. And the reason that they did this is that there would not be no conflict or the fear of a rebellion. So today, the family of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala is known as Ali Shaykh. If you see Ali Shaykh, that means he's from Muhammad ibn Wahhab's family. So whosoever name you will see today. And after his name, if you see Ali Shaykh, that means he's from Muhammad ibn Wahhab's And if you see Ali Saud, that means that they are from the family of Muhammad ibn Saud. Somebody is asking that uh, can you give us the death rate, please, and that the death rate is 1206 after it. Now, so somebody is asking so the Mufti of Saudi Arabia is from Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's family. Now, he's Ali Sheikh. Saleh Ali Sheikh is also from Muhammad ibn Wahab's family. He's also Ali Sheikh, meaning the grandchildren. So, whoever you see, that is from Ali Sheikh, his name is written as Ali Sheikh, they are from the family of Muhammad. So by this, Alhamdulillah, now, whenever a student of knowledge starts to study a book, the protocol or the methodology of studying the book is that he must read biography of the author. This is a standard procedure, which we have done today in the form of questions and answers. 
No book should be read or studied without reading the background of the author and the background of the book, which we will get to uh, when we contemplate and reflect upon the da'wah of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab we can see that his da'wah was based upon four fundamentals Usas al-da'wah Usas al-da'wati li Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab or li Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab if you read all his books you will find that the usus of his da'wah revolve around these four fundamentals. The first one is At-Tawheedu huwa al-Asas. The first one fundamental of his da'wah was At-Tawheed and which was the pinnacle of his da'wah. And when we talk about At-Tawheed here, remember whenever the word At-Tawheed is used with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala, it refers to Tawheed al-Ibadah or Tawheed al Call it whatever you want. If you say Tawheed al-Ibadah, then its ascription is to the slaves. If you say Tawheed al then its ascription is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his rights. Uluhiyya and Tawheed al-Ibadah. Second foundation is al ittiba al-Salaf. Follow the way of the Salaf, following the methodology and the manhaj of the Salaf. We all know the hadith of the Khayr al-Nas al-Qarni, from the ladina yaluna, from the ladina yaluna. The first three. Generations, the older generations of Islam. The third fundamental of his da'wah was ta'atu ulil amri wal nushula. Being obedient to the rulers and advising them when necessary. So being obedient to the rulers in ma'roof, not in ma'asim. That was the third fundamental of his doubt. The fourth is fiqh da'wati wa duat. Having the fiqh of da'wah and understanding the du'a, the callers having fit of what they have heard. This is what Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala's bird's eye view of everything that he wrote and everything that he did in his life from the time he started to seek knowledge till he died were well, based upon these four fundamentals. All can be derived directly back from the Qur'an and the Surah. And all can be traced back to the, to the messenger of Allah. Fiqh al-da'wati wa duat Having fiqh, the correct fiqh of da'wah. And the duat having the correct understanding of da'wah. Both are problematic today in the West. Problems that you see in the West today of those who oppose Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala and they try to disgrace him and slander him and lie against him. In the four fundamentals that I have mentioned, and the last one that I mentioned, fiqh da'wah wa du'at. It is for this reason that I fear, feel that there is a great need to talk about the usus of da'wah, the fundamentals of da'wah, which we studied in our master's program with the ulama. 
for you students. So you can understand. Once you understand the usus and the zawabit and the usul of da'wah, then you will understand where the problems are all stemming from. Because the equation is clear. Show us what difference or what different da'wah did Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah call to from his predecessors. His books are full of quotes from the scholars from the Salaf to the Khalaf. And people don't know that there was, there were identical revivalist movements, if you want to call them. I don't even like using the word movement, but if you want to call it, in the subcontinent. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah, he writes, Kitabu Tawheed. Shah Ismail al-Dahlawi, famously known as al-Shaheed, writes Taqwiyatul Imam. No record of both of them meeting in the same era. Both on different parts of the world. One is in the subcontinent, the other is in the Arabian Peninsula. If you look at the books, they are like a mirror to one another. Different style of writing, different approach, the goals and the objectives. The way that they extrapolate is exactly the same. So what makes Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah so different? If there were other scholars around the world who were calling to the same thing? Muhammad ibn Wahhab rahimahullah when people started slandering him. He wrote to the people of Qasim. He wrote a letter to him. He said, I take Allah as my witness and I take all the angels who are around me now who Allah has sent. I take them all of all of these angels also as my witness. But I believe what Al-Firqatun Najiyah, a safe sect, Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah, I believe in Allah. My Iman is with Allah. His angels, His books, His messages, resurrection after death. I have Iman in predestination. It's good and it's bad. It's for Allah. And when it comes to the Iman of Allah, I believe in everything that Allah has described Himself with in His book. All that has been described upon by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam upon His tongue. Without distorting, negating. Or rather, I believe that indeed Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala there is no one similar to and he is all hearing and all seeing. And I do not negate anything from him that which he has described himself. And I do not distort any words from their actual positions. And I do not reject the beautiful names and the ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nor do I ask how about his attributes. Nor do I draw similitudes or similarities between him and the creation. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no equal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have anybody who is parallel to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have a God. No analogy should be made with Allah with his creation. Because Allah is the most knowledgeable to him about himself and about others. And whatever he says is the truth. And his is the best speech. And he has freed himself from that which the opponents and the demons have described him. From asking how and making similitudes. And he has negated those who have negated from him, from those who distort and reject. And then he said, Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifun wa Salaamun Ala Musaleen wa Alhamdulillah This is what he said with regards to his beliefs in general. And he wrote to the people of Qasim who asked him, this is what they say about you. He said, I have come with nothing different than what Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. It's a beautiful letter. I think this should, letter should be translated into the English language. So people know. But he wrote to many people. The issue which I want to talk about now is 
Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad Abdul Wahab rahimahullah and Wasail, the resources or the sources that he utilized in calling to the Tawheed of Allah SWT. Or the different ways that he adopted. Wasail. Tools or helping tools, whatever you want to call it. We find that Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad Abdul Wahab rahimahullah ta'ala he adopted the way of writing. And in writing or illustrating, we can divide them into two categories. Books and treaties. With regards to his books, so understand, so now we know from, from the wasail. Do we understand the word wasila and wasail? Should be a good exact word which describes the context of which we are talking. The means, sources and means of how he gave that. Today we use technology, just the internet as a means to give that. And what were the means that Shaykh al-Islam relied upon for his da'wah? Said that his da'wah was of how he publicly spread his da'wah other than teaching and lecturing and that was books kutub and rasai writing books and treaties so his books firstly his books those books which call to tawhid so we find that he gave a lot of importance of his books on the subject of just tawhid so he wanted to explain what tawhid really was what Iman really was. And then he wanted to explain the dangers of deviating from Tawheed and falling into shirk. And you saw that in his entire life, this was the most important thing that he looked at or gave attention to. So for example, from the books that we have is Kitab Tawheed. كشف الشبه ثلاثة الأصول والأصول الثلاث القواعد الأرض أصول الإيمان كتاب مفيد مستفيد في كفر تارك التوحيد So these six books that I have mentioned clearly focus just on Tawheed كتاب مفيد المستفيد في كفر تارك التوحيد Now we have the Rasai or the treaties, or the small booklets, pamphlets, whatever you want to call them, that he wrote. This can be divided into two categories. Rasail Mu'allafa Amma, general treaties that he wrote, and Rasailu Shaksi, letters, personal letters that he wrote. With regards to Rasailu Amma, or the general treaties, that he wrote, then these rasai consist of Tawheed and Iman, and their number reaches 30. So the first book is Masail al and um, the first treatise is Masail al Jahili. Sheikh mentioned 120 issues in which the people of Jahiliyyah opposed the Prophet. The second is his explanation, Shar o Sittatu Mawadi Minasi, explaining six different incidents from the seerah of Rasulullah. And he used these six incidents again to bring them back to Tawheed and Shaykh. That's amazing. That when you study seerah, even seerah is studied on the premise of Tawheed. The third book is, or the third treatise is, Tafsiru Kalimati Tawheed. A bayanu ma'na la ilaha illa Meaning giving the explanation of the meaning of la ilaha The fourth is Talqeen usulul aqidati lil Basically teaching the normal layman the book um, issues of usul of aqidah This will be a good book to go through
The third is called Thalafu Masai, three issues. The first issue is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and didn't leave us to play. Second is that the greatest thing that we should hold system created with is not to associate partners with Allah. And the third thing is that we should single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all our acts of worship. The sixth treatise is Ma'na Ta'ud wa Ru'usu Anwa'i. Meaning of Ta'ud and its um, Ru'usu Anwa'i, its main categories. In there, the Shaykh Rahimullah mentioned what Ta'ud means and everything that is worshipped other than Allah is known as a Ta'ud. And then he went through and mentioned the five different types of Ta'ud, etc. Seventh treatise is known as Al Aslul Jami'u Li Ibadatillahi Wahd. Again, bringing a principle on understanding. The eighth is that بَعْدُ فَوَاعِدِ سُورَةُ الْفَاتِحَةِ Some benefits from Surah Al-Fatiha. فِي مَا يَتَعَلَّقْ بِالْأَقِيدَةِ Which are in relation to Aqeedah. The ninth is نَوَاقِدُ الْإِسْلَامِ See the difference now. The ulama don't consider نَوَاقِدُ الْإِسْلَامِ Islam to be from the books. They consider them to be from the Rasai. Understand this. Well, somebody asked, without waiting for me to go through all the books. So where does Nawaqid al Islam go? Somebody just wrote and said, Baraba Nawaqid al Islam. The tenth is Masail Mustambata min Qawlillahi ta'ala. The issues that can be derived from the statement of Allah, wa anna al Masajid al Illahi fala tadum Allahi ahda. Surah al Jinn, ayah number 18. The eleventh treatise is Thamaniya Halat, eight conditions. And the Shaykh extrapolated from the ayah of Surah Yunus, ayah number 104 to 106. The twelfth is Sitta to Usuli Adima Tinufi. Six important beneficial principles. And the thirteenth is Risala fi Tawheed al Ibadah. Thirteenth Risala is the best Risala that I have seen to give a lecture, to give a khutbah on Ibadah. Allah, I wish somebody was to translate this into the English language. The way he has. Written this is the most amazing way that he has comprehensively written everything. But it's an amazing result. So these are now 13 I mentioned. So there is a difference between Rasail and Kutu. People think Nawaqid al Islam is a book. You see them with the Mutun, they think Nawaqid al Islam. They don't realize that Nawaqid al Islam is from the Rasail of Sheikh al Islam. Masail al Jahiliya is from the Rasail, not from the books. Kitab al Tawheed is from the books. So now the personalized letters that he wrote. So these personalized letters of correspondence that he wrote, we can categorize them into four different categories. So he, wrote, he had correspondence with scholars and enemies, and he wrote the first category consists of 16 illustrations or letters in which the Shaykh makes bayan of his aqidah. Bayanu aqidah the Shaykh. How many are there? 16. Which the Shaykh sent to leaders, scholars, normal people, in which he clearly explained what his da'wah and what his call was. The reality of his da'wah and his call. And it also included the questions many people were asking about his Akhina. Or, or some affairs which required further explanation. Or he saw that it was wajib for them to know certain issues. So he explained all these in these 16 letters. The first letter is the, the one that I read to you. 
when he wrote to the people of Qasim and they asked him about his aqeel. The second letter was to Muhammad ibn Abbad Mutawwa, Tharmad. The third letter he wrote to is to a person called Muhammad ibn Abd from the Mutawa'a Tharmada. That he wrote another letter to Fadil Ali Mazid, the, the head of Badiyat al Shah. In there, he wrote a, this letter explaining to the Shaykh that the lies that the people are saying about him and the slandering that. He doesn't permit this and doesn't allow this. Then he wrote a, a letter to a Sawaidi from, from the scholars of Iraq. Then he wrote a letter to the scholars of Haram, Mecca al Madi. Look how much effort he made to clarify the lies that were being spread about. Then he wrote to a scholar from Medina explaining in there he explained to the scholar why the people were fighting with him and deferring with him. He wrote a letter the eighth, eighth letter he wrote was to a, a scholar by the name of Ibn Sayyah. The ninth letter he wrote was a letter to the general Muslims addressing them. The tenth letter he wrote was to Sheikh Hamd at tawaiji And you have fools that say that he wasn't an authority in Hamd al-Fiqh when he knew Issues of fiqh very well. For those who read his works, will only be able to speak. So those who don't read his works and like likes and hit, and and hits on their social media, but like they say that the dogs bark and the caravans go by. The qafila to tasiru wal kilabu tambah. The eleventh letter that he wrote was to Abdullah ibn Suhaim was a mutawwa from min ahl al a place called Majma'ah. The twelfth letter that he wrote was a letter to the general Muslims. Thirteenth letter that he wrote was to Ahmad al-Bukayli, sahib al-Yaman from Yaman. Fourteenth letter he wrote was to Ismail al-Jara'i from Yaman. Fifteenth letter that he wrote was to Abdullah ibn Abdullah al-San'an. And the 16th letter, it is said that he wrote to the people of Maghrib, Morocco. So this was the personalized letters that he wrote, the correspondence that he had, 16 of them explaining all about his aqidah, all, all about the misconceptions. And these people, they know of this. He wrote all this, clarifying every single doubt that these people are today bringing about him. He himself clarified those issues. Like they say, وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ Are you understanding? How much effort he made to correspond with all the scholars, even with his enemies. Writing to them and saying to them that don't lie against me. Why are you doing this propaganda against me? You, you say this about me? Let me tell you what I say about this issue. This is what I say. This is what I say and look at what the Salaf said. What different is it from what I am saying and they are saying? The second category Mutawwa. Mutawwa is a word that is used in Saudi Arabia for somebody whose, whose appearance seems to be that he's very religious. So if you have somebody in here now in Saudi Arabia, he has a beard and his thobe is above his ankles quite high, and they don't know, he, this person doesn't know your name. So he will call you out and you'll say, Mutawwa! Ya Mutawwa! Mutawwa means somebody who is religious. So they use this name. In India, Pakistan, they say Sufiji. But they don't mean Sufiji by, by Sufi, but Sufiji is somebody who they, 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 they just see as somebody who has been religious. So if they see you religious and they don't know your name, they'll say Sufiji. Or they might call you Hazrat. Or they might say Ya Mawlana. So this is what the word mutawwa means. Is that clear? In Saudi Arabia you'll see that they call you mutawwa. It depends. Some people might say it's to make fun of you and some people will say 
religiously. Because in Saudi Arabia, they don't like to call you by your name. Nobody calls each other by names. Everybody calls each other by their kunis. For example, I'm Abu Isa, my son is Isa. They will always say Abu Isa. Nobody will ever call me by my name. So the second category of, of the treaties are Muhammad Abdul Wahab rahimahullah explaining the categories of Tawheed. So for example, he wrote a treatise for somebody who used to call himself Hasan. And he wrote a letter to a man called Muhammad ibn Ubaid and Abdul Qadir al Uday and his son. He wrote a letter to Abdullah ibn Sahib. All of, all of these letters that he wrote were all explaining the categories of Tawheed and the meaning of Tawheed. He wrote a letter to, a letter to Muhammad ibn Sultan, fourth or fifth, he wrote a letter to the, all the Muslims explaining about the categories of Tawheed. The third category is of the treatise that he wrote was to explain the meaning of La ilaha illallah and that which contradicts it. So he wrote a letter to Thunayyan ibn Saud explaining the meaning of La ilaha. He wrote a letter to Abdurrahman ibn Rabi'ah. He wrote another letter explaining the meaning of La ilaha illallah, but it's not clear who he wrote. Then he wrote to the scholars of Islam. He wrote to the Muslims. He wrote to the people of Riyadh. Again, he wrote another letter to the Muslims. And in all these letters that we find, he explained the meaning of Laila. We know that the second, the category that before that was to explain the categories of the world. This is all letters specifically focusing on the meaning of Laila. The fourth category in which Sheikh al Islam. Muhammad al-Wahhab rahimahullah he wrote was explaining those things that if a person commits them or does them then he leaves the fall of Islam the perpetrator falls into kufr and it becomes obligatory to, to kill such a man due to his apostasy so he wrote a letter to Ahmad ibn Ibrahim the mutawwa from the city of Washington this person asked him with regards to takfir. And he explained the principles and conditions of takfir. They say that Muhammad Zulha would just make takfir like he's having some cookies. And then he explains clearly of what takfir and the dangers of takfir. Then he wrote a letter to Muhammad ibn Faris. And there he explained and gathered all the speech of all the scholars with regards to the issue of takfir and finished his letter to Muhammad bin Faris by, by mentioning the 10 nullifiers of Islam. Then he wrote a letter to Ahmad ibn Abdul Karim. And in there, in this letter, he some of the things which Ahmad ibn Abdul Karim was confused about with regards to takfir, he explained and clarified those doubts and those misconceptions. Then he wrote a letter to Suleiman ibn Suhaim again. Suleiman ibn Suhaim had written a book against the Sheikh. And the Sheikh, when he saw that this person had written against him, and lied against him, still the Sheikh was very nice and very gentle with him. But maybe he will be guided. And then the Sheikh refuted him, and when he found out that this man was adamant upon him, of rejecting the truth and staying steadfast upon Baati. And that he's aiding those who commit shirk and Tughiyya. Then the Shaykh wrote this letter. And then he mentioned the things which have made him leave the fold of Islam. Then he wrote a letter to the Tawa of Dar'iyya. The religious people of Dari. Again, they asked him the question really regards to takfir. So what is takfir permissible? And then he wrote a letter to some of his brothers 
with regards to the issue of At-Takfir. So by this we finish some of the books of Shaykh al-Islam, alhamdulillah, ta'ala, and how they have been divided. People just mention the books without knowing its categories and some of the rasai. There's a difference between the kutub and the rasai and the topics. So I will stop here then. And inshallah, we'll meet next week. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us life. And that one, I hope the lesson has been beneficial. So now we had a first preface. The first preface was just a madkhal on the etiquettes of seeking knowledge and the benefits and the virtues of seeking knowledge and some important matters relating to seeking knowledge. Now the second madkhal, after we've studied the biography of Muhammad Abdul Wahab and some of his works, we're going to now have a preface on the on actually how to study Al-Usul Al-Thalatha. So one will leave it here. بارك الله فيكم وجزاكم الله خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته